morning, everyone. Good to see you all. Let's pray and begin. Father, we thank you and we praise you always for the opportunity that we have to study the word, to learn and grow in you. And we know you're present with us because you have given us your spirit, the Holy Spirit, to lead and guide us into all truth and make the word come alive to us. So Holy Spirit, as you always do, think through my mind, speak through my lips, the illuminated word of God that has been revealed to us, and may it go forth to meet the needs of the people, spirit, soul, and body, and I know you'll see to it that the word goes forth with clarity, unhindered and unchecked by any unseen or opposing forces, because those forces have been neutralized, rendered ineffective as a result of the finished work of Christ at Calvary, and it's in that finished work that we do rest, for we have entered into your rest, Father, and there we remain, and where we remain is everything we need that pertains to life and godliness experiencing your shalom, nothing missing, nothing broken, walking in the fullness of your blessing, flourishing in every aspect of our lives as our souls flourish. And so I thank you for your peace that we have access to by faith, that peace that will let reign in our hearts, that peace that goes beyond our understanding when we choose not to be anxious or worry about anything, but in prayer and supplication make our requests known to you. It guards our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Every need is made according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. When we seek first the kingdom and your righteousness, knowing that all that we need will be added to us. We don't worry about it. We take no thought. You are Jehovah Shalom, our peace, and Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. And Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. You have healed us by sending the very best of yourself, your word, your son, Jesus the Christ, who took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. And by his stripes, we were healed again, spirit, soul and body. And so I thank you. Every weight, every burden, every depression, every anxiety and stress, every pain in the body, externally, internally, all must depart now in the name of Jesus. All must begin to depart in the name of Jesus. All must submit to the name that is far above them, the name of Jesus. And it's in that name that our healing has been provided. Father, I thank you that the hearts are ready this day, the soil, the ground is good the seed will be sown into it and it'll produce in our lives we will not just be hearers of the word but doers as well in the name of the lord jesus amen, amen. let's go to acts chapter 13 acts 13 and verse 1 All right, yep, Acts 13, beginning with verse 1. Now, in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Uh, Barnabas, or Barnabas, he was the Cypriot, the man of Cyprus, and we're We've already been introduced to him in the book of Acts. And then we have Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene. Again, you all know that I'm a history buff, and so I like to properly present the most accurate picture of history, possibly, if it's possible. And so, scripture-wise, you get a you get a rainbow of, of cultures and ethnicities in the scripture. I mean, you got your Europeans, you got your Greeks, you got your Romans, um, your Caesars, your Pontius Pilots, you, you have your, your North Africans, you have your, your Canaanites, your Egyptians, etc. And so this man here, these two men actually, were men of the continent that would later be called Africa, Simeon, who's, who was called Niger. Literally, Niger, in the Greek, it translates into black. And then Lucius of Cyrene. Cyrene was, was North Africa. And then it says Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. 
It says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said. And what I want to point out is that the scripture says there were certain prophets and teachers. So prophets and teachers were called by Jesus. Prophets and teachers of whatever skin complexion. Prophets and teachers of whatever ethnicity. It's, it's, who, it's who Jesus called to his church. Again, Israel the makeup and diversity of Israel was a microcosm of the makeup and diversity of the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God consists of how many cultures? Numerous. Uh, how, how many skin complexions? N numerous. Uh, is any one culture greater than the other in the kingdom of God? Is any one complexion greater than the other in the kingdom of God? As a matter of fact, once in, having entered into the kingdom of God, Christ is what we put on. Right, and it trumps everything. It circumvents everything. But God can use whatever flesh because ultimately that flesh is going to put on Christ. And so the only thing that should be seen anyway is Christ. But certain prophets, certain teachers. It says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, which means God said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. The Bible gives us much more detail about the life of a Paul and a Barnabas as opposed to, say, a Manan and a Simeon, but it lets you know that Manan and Simeon had their assignments and their callings. But what we're reading about here by inspiration of the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit said what? Separate to me who Paul and Barnabas, and they were, Saul we know, uh, primarily by his, his Gentile name, his Greek name, Paul, was the apostle to the Gentiles. And Barnabas too was an apostle in a similar vein, not the exact same vein, but in a similar vein as Paul. Verse three again, that having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to the home of Barnabas. They sailed to Cyprus. And this is coming from Seleucia. Seleucia was, in, was a place in, in Syria. It says, when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, they also had John as their assistant. This is the John we just read about in verse 25 of Acts chapter 12. Now again, take a look at this. Verse 4, this is after having just read that the Holy Spirit said, separate to me who? Paul or Saul and, and Barnabas. Verse 4 says, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went. Who went? Verse 5 says, and when they arrived, who arrived? Now, isn't this interesting that we're talking about Saul and Barnabas, and it says they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. Who was the apostle to the Jews? Peter. Who was the apostle to the Gentiles? Paul. But who's preaching to the Jews in the synagogue? Paul. Look at that. It, it, it is... It is it is amazing how God can give someone a, a primary assignment, but that's not all he's called them to do. Again, Peter being the apostle to the Jews, but it's Peter who preaches to the household of Cornelius and gets a Gentile household saved. Paul's very clear in the book of Galatians, chapter 1 and 2, that he is the apostle to, or he was the apostle to the Gentiles, and Paul was the apostle to the Jews, and yet we see Peter minister to Gentiles, and we see Paul minister to, to Jews. Here they are, Paul and Barnabas, preaching the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews with John as their assistant. And what does it mean for the two of them to have an assistant? Well, it can mean servant, or it can mean minister. Word can mean 
officer or attendant, one who aids one who preaches the gospel, but also one who themselves preaches the gospel. Verse 6, now when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet. So sorcerers are false prophets, automatically. If they're a sorcerer, they're a false prophet. Because the line between sorcery and prophecy is very thin. As a matter of fact, without the spirit who has inspired the message being acknowledged, a sorcery or a spell or a conjuring or a word of knowledge can sound very similar. That's why spirits have to be tested so that you can know whether something is from the Holy Spirit or something is from some familiar spirit or, or from some doctrine of demon. Now, we know no one can call Jesus Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So there are certain things that you can, you can look for and listen for to know whether one is of the Holy Spirit or whether one is of some other spirit. So here we have this certain sorcerer, this false prophet. He's a Jew whose name was what? Well, that means son of Jesus. So, so he's purporting to be the son of the son. Who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God, but Elemis, this is his real name, Elemis the sorcerer, which, which he was a wizard. His name literally means wise man. Remember, the wise men, like the wise men who came to see Jesus. The wise men of the many courts of the known world were sorcerers. They were astrologers. They were Chaldeans. They were wizards and spiritists and occultists and diviners and soothsayers. That's what they were. They were also identified as scientists. There's also a very thin line between science and magic. Science may as well be the modern magic. It says, Elemis the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood, him, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So this is the spreading of the gospel, because once the day of Pentecost had fully come, the gospel's spreading like wildfire. It's going all over the place, all over, all over the known world, beginning where? In Jerusalem. Elemis withstood them. It's just going to be a, a it's, going to, it's going to be a lifelong. <laughs> that's what it's going to be. Bless our hearts. Withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, right, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him, and said, "O oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, and you enemy of." Righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then what happened? The proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So here is probably a number of gifts of the Spirit operating right here in this, in this context because what, what kind of faith is, is needed to tell someone you will be blind for a time, which is what Paul told Elemis. And it says immediately once Paul said this, so it's the Holy Spirit that, that moved on Paul or moved through Paul for this to happen. It says immediately the dark mist fell on him and suddenly he's blind needing assistance needing to be led by the hand this was a uh, an act of 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 power this was an act this was miraculous 
uh, in part, it was the faith, the, the, the Holy Spirit's faith. When I say Holy Spirit's faith, I mean the gift of the Spirit that is faith. Right, not the faith we walk by or, or, or live by, but the faith that is distributed to one via the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit wills. That's the kind of faith that was necessary to tell someone you'll be blind in just a few seconds and then they're blind. And that's because what was Elemis, what was son of Jesus doing? He was leading people away from the way, leading people away from the faith, and, and the proconsul was, was intrigued by the faith, was interested in the faith. Elemis, the devil, ultimately didn't want him to turn to the faith. We see in verse 12, once this act occurred, then the proconsul believed, because when the miracles would go forth, the, the, the feats of supernatural faith, faith, faith already supernatural, but special faith would occur, or many would believe. The pro proconsul could not deny without a shadow of a doubt had to acknowledge that God is real the power of God is true verse 13 it says now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos they came to Perga in Pamphylia and John departing from them returned to Jerusalem but when they departed from Perga they came to Antioch in Sidia a lot of traveling going on, a lot of, a lot of locations already. I mean, we're seeing Cyprus and Salamis. We're seeing Perga and, and, and Paphos and, and Pamphylia. These are, these are areas in Cyprus, and then now they're in, they're in Asia Minor. It says, when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. So here Paul, which I believe this was a, a word of prophecy, because a word of prophecy brings about exhortation. It says, Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. So obviously the word Paul's about to deliver is not just for Israelites, but also for who? Anyone who fears God. This is a word for Jews and Gentiles. It says, the God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with an uplifted arm, he brought them out of it. Oh, Paul's doing what Stephen did in Acts chapter 7. They're giving a history of, of Israel, quick and fast, from Egypt up until right now. Right now in, in their day, that is. They dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with an uplifted arm he brought them out of it. Now for a time of about 40 years he put up with their ways in the wilderness, and when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land to them by allotment. That's what I love about reading what, what Stephen reveals. He gives us some details we can only find in his sermon, his sermon of the history of, of, of Israel up until Stephen's present day, and then Paul does the same thing here. Look at this specificity, seven nations in the land of Canaan. It says, and after that, he gave them judges for about how long? 450 years until Samuel, the prophet. And afterward, they asked for a king, so God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for how long? That word 40 pops up a lot. That number shows up. It's a number of proving, number of testing. It says that when he had removed him, he raised up for them David, who wasn't a Benjamite. He came from the tribe of Judah. David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. So what actually happens in Saul? What happens in Saul is God is able to prove his point. 
This is why he had them being governed by judges in the first place. Because God knows, God knows how the heart of a king works because God's a king. And so because God knows how, how the heart of a king works, and he definitely knows how the heart of a king works whose nature is sinful. All you have to do is look at all the other heathen kings, the heathen Canaanite kings, the, the heathen Egyptian kings. How did they operate? They operated a particular heathenistic way. And so what did God say? Well, for my people to be separate, they will be ruled by judges, a plurality of judges, judges who would serve particular terms. But what do the people want? They even said, they said, we want to be ruled like them. Now, now, in part, it was an immorality. It was an immorality on both sides, immorality in, in, in the leadership and immorality in the people as well. But to say we want to be ruled like them, meaning the rest of the Gentiles, what does God say? Okay, prophet, go tell them what comes with this. See if they're still willing to accept it. And after Samuel told them everything God said would happen to their sons and to their daughters, they said, we'll take it. And who did they get? They got the most insecure king you could find on the planet. They got Saul. And then from, right, from from, from David and, and, and Solomon, all the, all the kings of Israel and Judah, you had a number of Israelite and, and Jewish kings who, who turned away from God and turned God's people away from him. And this is what God said would happen, but they still wanted it. This is from this man's seed, verse 23, according to the promise, God raised up Israel, a savior, Jesus, after John had first preached before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, who do you think I am? I'm not he. But behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham. And those among you who fear God, again, this is not just for the seed of Abraham, the, the biological seed of Abraham, but for those who could potentially become the spiritual seed of Abraham as well. Again, the message is not just for the Jews. This is Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, who starts off preaching in the synagogues to Jews. What is he saying? Barnabas is right there with him. What is he saying? What I am telling you is for all mankind. Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, to you the word of this salvation has been sent for those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers because they did not know him nor even the voice of the prophets which are read every Sabbath having fulfilled them in condemning him. Paul saying the prophets, the prophets have been telling you about this coming Messiah and you still rejected him. You read them every Sabbath, and you still rejected them. It says, and though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. So, yes, his blood is on their hands. Rome's too, but on their hands. You, you, you sent an innocent man to his death. They chose Barabbas. They chose Barabbas to be free. A known rebel a seditionist, a threat to the Roman Empire. Bar Barabbas led groups of thieves in the night to harass and murder and steal from political leaders. And they said, let him go. Crucify this man who says he's the son of God. Verse 29, now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. He was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. And we declare to you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, and that he has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son. Today I have 
begotten you, and that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, sounds like Paul knows his old covenant. Sounds like Paul knows his psalms. Well, of course, we're talking about Saul here. In, in most cases, Saul probably. Now, 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 to be a rabbi, you got to know Genesis to Deuteronomy by heart. Memory. All of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, to Deuteronomy by memory. Saul probably knew Genesis to Malachi by memory because he was a Pharisee. He, he, was, he was the best of the students of Gamaliel. And Gamaliel was a well-respected. Gamaliel is the one in Acts 5 who had to calm everyone down because they were flipping out over this message, going forth this message of Jesus. And what did Gamaliel say? You don't have to fight this. Remember the other false prophets? Remember the other so-called Messiah figures? They went about gathering followers and, and converts, and then they died, and then their people were scattered, and the message failed, withered away and died. He says, so you don't have to fight this message of Jesus because if it's untrue like the others, it'll fade away. But if it's true, you can't fight God. That's who Paul was a student of. And Paul's just dropping these psalms left and right. Verse 35, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your holy one to see corruption because the body begins to corrupt after how long? Three after three days. Verse 36, for David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and he saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins, and by him everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. The law of Moses was, was, was actually... See, the law of Moses, the Bible says the strength of sin is in the law. Meaning what? Meaning that, that the law enhances or magnifies the sinful nature. The law of Moses was, was the perfect law from God, but a perfect law that in no way could be kept. It couldn't be kept. So what does Jesus do? He fulfills that, and all we have to do is believe on him, Jew or Gentile. But the law of Moses alone couldn't justify. Verse 40, beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though one were, declare it to you, one were to declare it to you. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Isn't this odd that it's the Jews making this request? The Jews are begging. I mean, the Gentiles are begging. How come the Jews weren't begging? Now, now, we know that it wasn't all the Jews. The next verse will, will establish that it's not, it wasn't all the Jews, but why is it that the Gentiles are the ones begging to hear this message again? So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, it's the Gentiles begging that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now, when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews, many of the Jews, so we see Jews that believed. Many implies it wasn't all. Many of the Jews and devout proselytes. There it is again. See, Jew and Gentile. Devout proselyte converts follow Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them, continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming, and they opposed the things spoken by Paul. So, so congregational size jealousy existed way back then. Yeah, you know, some people solely talked about Christian Christian Center just because of large crowds. Because they couldn't garner a large crowd. Which tells me your heart wasn't 
in the right place in the beginning. You're like the Pharisees who want to be seen on the corners praying. You want to do your deeds before men to be seen by men. But when you're not looking for it, God will exalt you. You're just looking to please God, and that's all. He'll do the, the exalting. Verse 46, Paul and Barnabas, it says, then grew bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. It was necessary. Now, I've, I've, I've again, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know all the word. I know some, and I've read it a lot. And in searching for scriptures as to how one can go to hell, I have only found scriptures where individuals send themselves there. God created hell for the devil and his angels. Because what does it mean to prepare something? And the Bible says, Jesus preaches this when he's preaching about the, the sheep and the goats, which most people butcher that. I think sheep and goats have to do with just believers, have to do with us. They got nothing to do with us. It has to do with nations. That's when God judges the nations. He will judge the church at the judgment seat of Christ. He will then judge the nations. We, the church, will be there with him judging the nations, and then he will judge at the great white throne judgment. It's three different judgments. Matthew 25 is about the sheep and the goats. It's about the nations, the nations who will follow him and the, the nations who will reject him during the seven years of tribulation. Sheep will be on one side. Goats will be on the other. The sheep will receive everlasting life. The goats will be humbly requested to enter into everlasting fire. In which the scripture says, prepared for the devil and his angels. I can't find one scripture that says everlasting fire was prepared for men. Was prepared for, hu but humans will be there. How do they get there? God's bored and just randomly decides, you know what? You six, you go to hell. You eight, you go to heaven. Is that how it works? No. We're about to see how it works right here. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it, since you reject it, and what? Judge yourself. Wait a minute. They judge themselves? Isn't that what we've been called to? Yeah. To judge ourselves? You judge yourselves what? Unworthy. unworthy of, well, if you've judged yourself unworthy of everlasting life, what have you judged yourself worthy of? Everlasting condemnation. That's the only other option. It's everlasting life or everlasting condemnation. This is what's beautiful about everlasting life and everlasting condemnation. I get to choose. When the gospel is preached, faith comes. In a few chapters, we'll see it in Acts 17. Some of us sadly will reject, just like the Jews right here. Since you reject it, and there will be those who reason and there will be those who receive. You reject it, well, you judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, so who do we turn to? Behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I've set you as a light to the Gentiles. That's Paul and Barnabas. That you should be for the salvation, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and they glorified the word of the Lord. And many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. See, it's words like this that confuse people about predestination. When they see how 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 certain scriptures are worded. See, I wish, I wish Rick Renner was here right now. He could, he could pick apart all of this and explain in the, in, the, in the truest forms of the languages. Now, mankind is not deserving of salvation because of sin. Let's not forget that, but because of the grace of God. We also have to consider 
God did not create man so that man could spend eternity away from him. It's not why he created the Adam and all those who would come from the Adam. He didn't create man to spend eternity. So, so there was a, watch this. Again, I'm only going from the limited knowledge that I have, but sometimes I'm flustered with the laziness of, of leaders in the church and what they teach. And not presenting the truths of Scripture from a a a perspective of God and the timing in which God lives. So, again, because God's not bound by time, God in one breath can say, don't eat from this tree. In the day you eat of it, you will. And in the same breath and same mind, can see his son Jesus as the Lamb of God slain before the foundations of the world. Now, if you don't know, if you don't know the eternal now or understand the eternal now that God exists in, then one would read that and say, oh, God always planned for there to be failure. Because he always planned for Jesus to be sent. No, 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 no. Everything that has ever happened and everything that is happening and everything that will happen is happening now with God because he only has now. Amen. Slain before the foundations of the world, that has a different meaning to us than it does to God because we're bound by time. He is not. So for God slain before the foundations of the world and the actual day in which he was slain as well as the day in which Adam sinned as well as the day in which Lucifer fell as well as the day in which Moses led the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage and as well as the day David became king and all the events of Revelation they're all happening now for God it's different aspects of time for us because we live in a realm of time so when we read a scripture, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believe, oh, well, there it is. Clearly, God has chosen some to be appointed to eternal life and has chosen some to be appointed to eternal condemnation. Now, on the surface, that would sound unfair to me. One response might be, though, so what? Man was deserving of death in the first place. But throughout the scripture, we see a God that presents things to his people and says, make a choice. Deuteronomy 30, 19. Israel, over here, I'm over here. Israel, hey, over here, right here. Israel, see right here, here's life. See over here, there's death. With the life comes blessing. With the death comes cursing. Choose life. It'll be well with you and your descendants. Now, God has foreknowledge, so he already knows what's going to happen. Because he has foreknowledge, that doesn't mean he's ordained everything. Just because you know what's going to happen before it happens doesn't mean you've ordained it to happen. You, you just know because you're God. You can't help but to know. Not only do you know all things at once, you know all things at once and all things that will happen. And you know all of that at once. Because you're God. Doesn't mean it's all been ordained and appointed. God desires that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what Paul tells Timothy. Now, is it possible? And this is just a possibility. I'm just throwing this one out. I talked about this during the Revelation message. And I've also talked about this in preaching on Romans chapter 9, because if you read Romans chapter 9, I mean, that chapter, it seems like God has straight up ordained some to go to hell and some to go to heaven. But is it possible 
that, again, because God lives in one now, based on his foreknowledge, he can simply call those who would be doomed to hell based on what he knows and not what he's ordained. In other words, doesn't God already know in advance everyone who will reject Jesus? And for God, it's not sometime down the line they're going to do it. It's now. So again, so, so, so go back to verse 46 and look at this. Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. What did God ordain? God ordained the word of God to be spoken to them via Paul and Barnabas. But Paul and Barnabas had to make a choice to obey God and speak the word. Then it says what? It says, but since you reject it, God made them reject it? Since you reject it, you judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life. Behold, we turn to the Gentiles. But wait a minute, there's going to be Gentiles who reject too. Just like, wait a minute, look here in verse 43. There's Jews who received it. So some Jews receive, some Jews rejected, some Gentiles receive, some Gentiles reject. That's God playing some kind of cosmic game of checkers or God has presented and made available and we make a choice to reject or receive. Again, verse 48, now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and they glorified the word of the Lord and, ha and as many as had been appointed to eternal life, they believed. And if you... And look how, look, how that, look how that's worded anyway. They believed after they were appointed? Again, we're talking about God here, so it would really read the same way. Once you believe the gospel, what has been appointed to you? Eternal life. You don't get eternal life unless you believe. You got to believe first. You got to confess and believe. When you confess and believe, you inherit eternal life. You don't have eternal life before you believe. You have to believe. Again, some of the many problems with the English translation of Scripture, the way certain, certain sentences are laid out, it looks like God is saying this when God wasn't saying that. But men, we get in the way. And when we get in the way, we start whole denominations over it and, and garner entire followings. And then we say, this is the only way you can be saved. Or this is the only way that you can be a believer. Verse 49, and the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region, but the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and did what? Expelled them from their region, but they shook off the dust from their feet against them, and they came to Iconium. And the disciples were what? Filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Now it happened in Iconium. Chapter 14, verse 1, that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a great multitude, both of the what? And the beginning of the Gentiles. The, the beginning of the Gentiles, the spreading of the message of the kingdom of God began with the Greeks, the first of the Gentiles. So spoke that a great number of both Jews and Greeks did what? The believing came after the speaking. Again, from God's perspective, because he knows all things, he knows in advance those who will believe and that since they've been appointed before they believe. From his perspective, it's all happening now. But in our realm... I don't get appointed eternal life until I believe, and I don't believe until I first hear. Somebody's got to preach the gospel so I can hear the gospel. 
What comes by hearing? Faith. Faith for the gospel of salvation comes by hearing. It hits my heart, and some people's hearts are so hardened that they say, I'll pass. There are, there are some who say, I'll pass, because they can't get with the message they're hearing, and there are some people who say, I'll pass, because they like Satan. They just prefer the devil. You've got, see, the devil has two, kind, two types of children, those that don't know he's their daddy. And those that do. Verse 2. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Therefore, they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting what? Signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Again, you can't, you can't, you, you can't deny a sign and wonder. Now, you might wonder where the wonder comes from because the devil can do wonders too but his wonders don't they can't be sustained in the way god's wonders can be sustained right and and you all remember this from the plagues of egypt don't you recall the plagues of egypt don't you recall pharaoh's wise men started off they, they, oh, they, they could turn their rods into snakes, too. They could turn a little bit of water into blood, too. But then the plagues got a bit too complicated. <laughs> and they couldn't keep up, could they? Because the power of Satan has an expiration date. <laughs> Not God's. Amen. Verse 4. But the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles, apostolis, the messengers. And then a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them. Why? Because remember, the unbelieving Jews were poisoning the minds of Gentiles. Verse 6, they became aware of it, and they fled to Lystra and Derb, cities of Laconia, into the surrounding region, and there they were preaching the gospel. I mean, they just, they just, they just moved from one place to another, just preaching the gospel. And they went, to a, they went to a pretty, pretty rough territory because Lyconia was known as Wolfland. <laughs> but we're preaching the gospel, so we're doing God's work. He got us. Amen. And there they were preaching the gospel. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. What is he going to need? He sounds like the man at the gate, beautiful. Sounds like he's going to need a miracle of healing, not just a healing, because he's never walked before. So there, there really is nothing to heal. A miraculous move must take place for this man to walk. This man heard Paul speaking, so faith came by hearing, correct? Paul observed him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed. Paul could see he had faith. Paul could see he was positioned to receive. But Paul's got to operate in faith too. Matter of fact, not just his faith, it's got to go beyond his faith. I mean, for what I think that's about to happen, in order for it to happen, the Holy Spirit's going to have to step in. We're going to have to see a sign and a wonder. We're going to have to see, see the faith and miracles of the Holy Spirit manifest right now. Paul, observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. Paul just yelled that out. It says, and he leaped and walked. Now, picture this. You got a, you got a group of Gentiles witnessing this. What are they going to think? They're, they're, they're seeing this. With, they're see, they know this man is a cripple. From his mother's womb, they know this man has never walked. And all of a sudden, these two strangers come, speaking some words, and this man gets up and walks. What are these Gentiles going to believe? What are they going to think? The gods have appeared before us. Zeus has so decided to make himself known to us. Because they weren't raised in... El Shaddai. 
They weren't raised in Yahweh. They were raised in Zeus and Poseidon. And so what happens? After Paul says, stand up straight on your feet, and he leaped and walked. Now when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices saying in the Laconian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Now they already believed that this was possible. First off, we know it happened in the past. We know it first happened when the angels came down in the likeness of men. In fact, angels have come down in the likeness of men numerous times in Scripture. So the gods coming down in the likeness of men isn't, a, isn't unfamiliar to these Gentiles because we've all heard of Hercules. Haven't we? Everybody's heard of Hercules. Even if you don't know anything else about Greek or Roman mythology, everybody's heard of Hercules. And everybody knows Hercules is... He's a demigod. He's half God and half human. Everybody knows that. Well, he's the son of Zeus, son of Jupiter. So many tales, along with all of the other supposed demigods, have been told before. So the people somewhat expect at some point the gods will manifest and come down in the likeness of men. Well, here comes this Paul. Here comes this stranger. Here comes someone they don't recognize saying what? You over there who, who has never walked in your life, get up and walk now. And they raised their voices saying in the Laconian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas, they called him Zeus. They said Barnabas is, is the king of the gods. And, and, and Paul, they called Paul Hermes because he was, he was the chief speaker. Hermes was the, was the god of commerce. He, he was a trickster god, too. And, and he was, as the scripture identifies, the chief speaker. It says, Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, intending to do what? Sacrifice with the multitude. Let's make a sacrifice. The gods have come down. They have blessed this cripple. He can now walk. Let's do what? Well, it only makes sense. The gods come down and bless you. You offer a what? So they bring oxen and they bring garlands to the gates. The wreath, the, the crown, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitudes crying out. And normally in Jewish custom, you, you would tear your, you'd tear your clothes in a number of contexts, but those contexts all had one thing in common. It was something related to distress, it was something related to, to something that has most likely occurred through your hands or something that's come out of your mouth that is somewhat shocking, maybe blasphemous. Remember when Jesus said he was the son of God, Caiaphas tore his clothes. So Caiaphas feels like he's hearing something that is what? Blasphemous. Our clothes were... Clothes may, clothes may have been torn during the loss of a loved one, a traumatic death. So Barnabas and Paul hear what? They hear humans beginning to worship them as gods, and they tear their clothes. It says, ran in among the multitude, crying out, saying, men, why are you doing these things? We're men with the same nature as you. And preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness and that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And when these things and with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them after they attempt to stop the people from doing it. Telling them, we're men like you. Telling them, we actually know who God really is. All of your gods of, the, of this and goddesses of that, they're useless. We can actually introduce you to the God of the sea and the God who filled the seas. And they couldn't stop the people from sacrificing to him. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, having persuaded the multitudes... They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. 
and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derb. I haven't done the math. I have not done the years. But Daddy had a theory that this might have been when Paul died over in 2 Corinthians 12. When Paul said, I knew a man in the body or out of the body, I don't know. But God knows. So he was stoned to near death. This says supposing him to be dead. Now, if this is the same account, then Paul would have to say, I don't know if I died or if I was almost dead. Because he said in the body or out of the body, I don't know. I don't know if it was an out-of-body experience or an in-the-body experience. He's only God knows. He was caught up to the third heaven. He was caught up to paradise. So look at this. They, they, they're used by the Spirit of God to deliver a miracle of healing to a man. The people say the gods have come down in the likeness of men. They, they, they prepared a sacrifice to them. Paul and Barnabas stop and say, no, 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 we're just men. We're just men. Let us tell you about the real God. And the people still want to sacrifice to them. The people heard what Paul said. They heard what Barnabas said. And yet they still see him as God. But then here come the Jews from Antioch and Iconium. And the multitudes, for whatever reason, believe them. Enough to do what? Attack Paul and Barnabas. Verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. I mean, they're literally going back to places where people wanted to kill them. This is why we, could, we can almost go anywhere in the world and proclaim our Savior freely because of, because of what things that men like Paul and Barnabas did and how they took the gospel into the most hostile of territories. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Now, and after they had passed through Pisidia, Pisidia and came to Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Adelia. From there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had completed. Now, when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So they stayed there a long time. You got to pay attention to words like this because in the midst of the many persecutions they experienced, they had many moments of peace and moments of, moments of rest. They stayed there a long time with the disciples. Father, we thank you for your word. It's life and truth. It will not, cannot return to you void, but will accomplish what it's set out to do. It will prosper where it's sent. And I thank you that the word has gone forth and the seed has been sown. It has been planted into the hearts of those present and those watching. I thank you, Father, that the word did not fall on deaf ears, that it will produce in the lives of those who have received it. Because your word be, your word does not return to you empty or useless, but it accomplishes when you send it, prospers where you send it. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for making the invitations I mentioned in just a moment available to the people. If you do not know the Savior, you can know him today. Jesus the Christ. He is the way to the Father. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's being born again or born of the Spirit of God. But the disciples he then called to be filled with the Spirit of God, to receive the gift of the Spirit. Anyone who is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ can be filled with the Spirit. Like salvation is received by an act of faith, so is the Holy Spirit received by 
an act of faith. And if you're not filled, you can be filled today. It is the only way to be a witness. It is the only way to live the victorious and overcoming life that Jesus came to bring us. If you're not a part of a local body, flock, family of faith, and you showed up here today or you tuned in today, it was not accidental. God is a God of purpose. This is a ministry where you learn and grow in the things of the Spirit. And lastly, for assurance of salvation. God wants you to know without a doubt you're saved. No more uncertainty, no more wondering. You can be just as sure as you know how old you are and as you know your name. I was for again to be saved, to be filled with the Spirit, to make this ministry your home for assurance of salvation. If any one of these or combination of these apply to you, I want you to raise your hand where you're seated. Raise your hand wherever you're watching. I'll pray with you in just a second. We don't want anyone to miss out on the best decision or decisions you can make in your life. Okay, it appears everyone thus far in here is good. For those of you, wherever you're watching, I'm going to ask that you repeat after me. I'm going to ask that everyone repeat after me a prayer for salvation, a prayer to be filled with the Spirit for salvation. Simply say, Dear God, Dear God I, repent of my sins. I repent of my sins. I confess with my mouth, I confess with my mouth. The, Lord the Lord Jesus, and I believe in my heart that you've raised him from the dead. Therefore, according to your word, I am now saved. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. To be filled with the Spirit, simply repeat after me, saying, Heavenly Father, by faith, I receive the gift of the Spirit. I am now filled with the Spirit. I have received my heavenly language. But most importantly, I am now a witness for the king and kingdom. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. If you prayed these prayers the very first time, you're in the family of God. Filled with the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. You may wonder, what is my next move? If you have questions, you can reach out to us by way of the email address you see on the screen. Admin at faithdome.org. We look forward to hearing from you. Is there anyone, as a result of having prayed, you can now say, I am saved, filled with the Spirit. In other words, that was your first time. Or an assurance. But it appears that everyone is good. All right. Well, it is time to sow. It is time to give. And we sow and we give happily and hilariously and excitedly. We get to contribute to what God is doing in the earth realm. Financially, that is. And we know the laws of sowing and reaping. We know how the law works. We know if we cooperate with the law, we can reap the benefits of the law. Because whatever one sows, so shall that one reap. And reaping will come in due season. Reaping will come at the right time. Reaping will come at the perfect time. We just need to make sure that we don't grow weary, tired, or fatigued in the doing of good deeds, and that we don't lose heart. Many ways to give are on the screen, but if you're already ready, or if you're lifting your hands up, simply to be on one accord, I'll pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for the opportunity that we have to sow towards your kingdom efforts in the earth realm. We count it an honor and privilege to be what you call us, fellow workers with you, the laborers going forth into the plentiful harvest. And I thank you that as we give this day, according to what we have, as we purpose in our heart, doing so cheerfully, that we will reap the corresponding manifold return on our giving. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. amen. Father, we thank you for your healing power. You are Jehovah Rapha. Lord, our healer, we have called your covenant name, and you have heard. We thank you for those who have received. They have received the manifestation. The pain is gone. The heaviness has departed. They are experiencing your freedom right now. 
to rejoice with them. I continue to stand, however, in faith and agreement with those that have yet to see. Key words, Father, yet to see. Not that they will not see, but have yet to see. If we believe, we receive, and we pray, we'll have. Amen. And we know that praying according to your will causes you to hear us and respond. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, if you're at home, just reach out or wherever you are. Just stretch your hands forth towards the screen. If there's anyone here, just stand up where you are if you want healing specifically. Praise God. Father, we thank you for your healing power, your delivering power, your victorious power, your transformative power. You said, let the elders of the church pray for the prayer of faith and lay hands on the sick, as well as those contending with sickness. Father, we know in Christ we are not the sick and may be having a bout with sickness and disease. He said believing ones would lay hands on the sick, but believing ones could also lay hands on those contending with having a bout with sickness or disease, and they would recover. You will raise them up. And so we thank you for your healing power, and we receive it by faith. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. couple of announcements. Your help is needed. URM Union Rescue Mission is in urgent need of hygiene donations. Join Lady Angel and me as we support URM with the following hygiene donations. Hand soap, body lotion, shampoo and conditioner, deodorant, toothpaste and toothbrushes, travel size, body wash, bath towels, underwear for men, women, and children, and men's undershirts. Donations may be dropped off in the, main, in the uh, Faith Domain for you and Sunday. If you prefer to make a cash donation, you may use the PR, Pure Religion, designation code. And the CCC Worship Arts Department and Young Adult Ministry invite you to an unforgettable night of praise and worship on Thursday, March 21st in the Faith Dome at 7.30 p.m. All ages are welcome. Let's come together to lift Jesus high and invite the Holy Spirit to move mightily among us. Don't miss this powerful worship experience. Save the date and spread the word. And tomorrow with Elder Bowden here in the Fellowship Center, Corporate Intercessory Prayer at 7.30 p.m. Don't forget, we lose an hour this weekend. By the next day, you don't feel like you've lost an hour, but just in that moment. If we would just go to bed on time, we wouldn't even feel like we lost an hour. Some of us stay up until the hour changes. And we look forward to seeing you this evening for Bible study or tuning in. Let's stand. Father, we thank you always for the opportunity to hear the word. We thank you for the opportunity to fellowship together one with another. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your divine protection that is on us at all times, destroying the works of darkness, canceling every demonic assignment set against us, and we thank you for our ministering spirits, our guardian angels, not only protecting us, but ministering for us when they hear us speak your word, Father, and when they see us live out your word. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. amen. See you guys later.